So, Paulina Neuding yes. from Sweden, welcome to my humble abode. <laughs> Thank and you. And meet uh, Marky. Um, you used to uh, uh, edit a conservative journal in Swedish, right? Is that a, um, a center-right journal at first, and then one that didn't have any political orientation, actually, was the last one. How did you... You were very young when you started it, right? 20-something? Yeah, I, I was 27 when I became editor-in-chief, yeah. How did that come about? <clears throat> I think it sounds more uh, strange than it actually is in Sweden. We uh, um, Sweden is very peculiar in that sense. It's easy to rise quickly when you're young for some reason. And also in journalism. But, yes, but, definitely in journalism. But at least from afar, it looks like it's very hard to be a center or moderate right wing intellectual in Sweden. Isn't Sweden like off the charts progressive in its public it sphere? It is, it is, but things are changing in Sweden now as well. We see this turn towards more um, conservative values, actually, even among young, younger, uh, the younger generation. So that's quite inter interesting. I think what shocked me in one of our conversations over the years is that you pointed out some uh, Swedish chief of police who said that they're not publishing statistics about crime because that would create bias mm. against immigrants. Uh, there have been a number of those cases, actually. I, I'm not sure which one you think of exactly, but there was after Cologne, after the mass attacks against women in Cologne on New Year's Eve 2015, it transpired that a similar thing had happened in Sweden at a youth music festival in Stockholm, in the capital. And that happened two years in a row. And uh, it was the same type of attacks. It was groups of men, young men, who encircled girls and attacked them. Um, and uh, there, uh, the police actually said that we didn't say anything to the public because we didn't want to play into the hands of the Sweden Democrats or Sweden's anti-immigration party. So <clears throat> rather than warning girls who would go to this youth festival or their parents, uh, they would not say anything to the public. So we've almost reached a point where people are actually making the argument that the truth is racist and therefore don't mention it. Um, you could put it that way, yes. So give us just an overview of the, the uh, immigration situation in Sweden. Mm. So Sweden has taken in about 10% of its population in the past decade. Uh, and we took the highest number per capita during the immigration wave in 2015. Uh, more than 160,000 uh, in a population of 10 million. So uh, numbers are extremely high, both for Sweden historically and for, for Europe at large. And how, um, how has that played out? I understand you don't think it's a great success. I don't think it's a great success on the whole. I mean, it's important to point out that there are lots of individual cases that are very successful. But if you look at it um, in general, we can see that a majority of unemployed people in Sweden are now immigrants. A majority of... or virtually all areas of social exclusion, as we call them, with a euphemism, uh, are uh, The euphemism is for, for <laughs> neighborhoods you can't go into? Not really, no. Sometimes uh, for, for some groups. I mean, there are neighborhoods. There is one now in the news where there's no delivery of packages, for instance, because it's too dangerous. Uh, there was one neighborhood where um, where there was free parking for months because uh, traffic guards couldn't go there. It was too dangerous. We have areas where police uh, or ambulance and firefighters have to await police protection before they go in. Uh, these areas shift, so you can't say that this is a no-go zone for everyone and forever. But there are definitely areas where you can't go if you're a, an ambulance driver. You wouldn't go there by yourself. But what was the original agenda? Was it multiculturalism and saying that, you know, let's create cultural enclaves for people with different culture and respect them? Or was it, we are going to try and find some common ground in which, or common values which we will demand everyone to integrate into? Exactly. What was the paradigm? So you're talking about it as if there was a plan, which there wasn't. So that's important. That's the first thing to understand that we opened up our borders 
And like many other countries in Europe, we said, there's no other way. This is a must. This is the way it has to go because of liberalism, because of human rights, because of the Geneva Convention and so on. This, this is beyond discussion, basically. And even if it was open to discussion, it will all work out. We're all human beings. We're all people. It will, you know, it will sort itself. Yes, you know, I have a friend, Dan Shiftan, who is um, not at all politically correct. So he, his metaphor for this is, uh, for these problems of immigration, is always saying these are not future Swedes. I don't know why the Swedes are his uh, favorite uh, <laughs> epitome of, 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 of the Euro Europeans. But it seems like, you know, in many European countries, it looks from the outside like a a drama of guilt and self-flagellation, as if Europe has lost its will to it, its own belief in itself. It's like it's almost um, uh, welcoming its own demise. Sure. I mean, there is an aspect of uh, if this is bad for us, then we're only getting what we deserve because of colonialism and imperialism and, uh, and uh, the Second World War and the Holocaust and so on. And there is there is a parallel definitely to Germany where this guilt obviously is very strong. Um, also in, Sweden cooperated with Germany in the exactly, Second World War. Exactly. So there is a sense of guilt for the Second World War and the Holocaust in Sweden as well, um, which is um, affecting this. It, it, that is not helping Jews. This, uh, it isn't. Yes. What, which what's is the situation quite with the Jewish community? So um, speaking of no-go zones, there was a Swedish... Um, um, a Swedish broadcaster sent uh, two journalists into uh, an area of social exclusion in uh, Malmo in southern Sweden, wearing a kippa and a Star of David. And they walked around Malmo and they got to hear lots of things about them being uh, damn Jews and so on. But when they walked into this area of social exclusion, they were chased out. And it wasn't just in individual attackers, it was a communal effort where people were throwing eggs from the windows and... Um, oh, oh Marky yeah. <laughs> is protesting the situation yeah. of Jews in Sweden. Exactly. So, um, and later it turned out that people, there had actually been chains of text messages saying there are Jews in the area, throw eggs from windows. And, so, this, and this goes un unpunished. unpunished by the authorities in Sweden? You know, when, when Donald Trump decided to move the, um, announced that he would move the American embassy in Israel, uh, some 200 people uh, demonstrated in central Malmo, declaring an intifada for Malmo, saying that we will shoot the Jews. Um, in Stockholm, there was another... But the, these are, these are mostly an, Muslims and, and, and North Africans, or... Are, is the Swedish left cooperating with this actively? Uh, no, not when an an Not kill thing. the Jews. Not kill the Jews. That's beyond the pale. But um, for now, for, for now. Um, so, but there were no uh, no prosecutions. There was no um, there were no legal uh, consequences of that, as far as I know. Um, is the BDS the movement to boycott um, Israel? which is, we know here, is clearly anti-Semitic. If, if you go to their website, they support the right of return, which means flooding Israel with Palestinian refugees, not acknowledging the right of Jews to self-determination. Is that uh, kosher? Is that, that's probably not a good word. Is that um, common on the left? Um, there isn't a huge debate about BDS in Sweden, unlike uh, Britain, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has to do with the fact that Sweden is just solidly anti-Israeli. It's, it's not something... Everyone? That's... Across the board? Or how are the Swedish Democrats? So that's quite interesting. The Swedish Democrats are trying to, to uh, look pro-Jewish and therefore pro-Israeli in some sense. Um, that's where they have positioned themselves. So they must be fascists, of course. Or are they... Are they, is this, an, is this a dangerous extreme form of right wing or is, how do, what's your assessment of the party? So I think Eric Kaufman, I think it is, um, uh, the British scholar, I, I think he used the term bootlegging. It's like bootlegging. If you don't give the people the policies they want, a bootlegger will show up and, uh, and provide it for them. So that's the situation with the Sweden Democrats. There has been a solid major majority against uh, increased immigration in Sweden for decades. And the only thing the Swedes have got is more and more immigration. As I said, 10% of the population in, in a decade 
in a country where the people is against the people are against increased immigration. That's a risky policy, right? But so, so how did it how so, did it come about that the government does what the people? Uh, no, but hang on. So so we had seven parties who were in favor of this policy, and no one who was against it. It was impossible to vote for anyone who was against it. So the Sweden Democrats, who was a party that in the 90s definitely was infested with neo Nazis, they grew and grew and grew, and now have 17 point something percent in the parliament which is huge. This is a huge upheaval in a consensus-oriented country like Sweden. Yeah. Sweden is a, isn't a country where you rally against elites like that. that that's, that's not really done in Sweden. So, but the, the dynamic is that if you delegitimize any form of right wing and you call everyone Nazis, you will actually get the Nazis in the end. That's part of the problem. I mean, if you call everybody a Nazi, then you don't have any words left for actual Nazis. That's, right, exactly. You know. uh, but then you have 200 people rallying in central Malmo, declaring an intifada from, from Malmo, saying we, we will kill the Jews. And that's, that's a bit unsettling, I would say, for, for the Jewish community. And only the so-called neo-Nazis are standing up against that? Or am I exaggerating? Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that, that, that they are standing. That would be really standing. weird for Israelis. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, I wouldn't say that the Sweden Democrats are necessarily standing up against it, but there is no one in the political establishment, or there wasn't for many years, who would say, "Here's the trade-off: we we can have these open borders, but that wouldn't compromise the security of the Jewish minority in Sweden." No one would say that. And when I tried to say that, I was uh, compared to Breivik in uh, Scandinavia's biggest newspaper. And they, they wrote an editorial comparing me to, to the Norwegian child killer, uh, which is a different story. But it was simply impossible to say that this is the trade-off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th there's, there's um, a, a, difficult, a difficulty in... Um, finding room for opinions that are not sanctioned explicitly by the politically correct crowd. So how is, is it a small elite controlling the whole debate? Is it half the Swedish people? What's, how, do you, how do you assess the, the, the size of its constituency? So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there's always been a very small minority who has been in favor of increased immigration. But if you look at the um, at the newspapers or the media or the political parties, there hasn't really been any room for the view that, you know, maybe we've had enough immigration for a while, maybe we can slow down the pace now. Uh, that hasn't been considered um, a legitimate position. So when um, uh, Fredrik Reinfeldt, our former prime minister from the moderate party, he famously said before the elections in 2014, he said, I'm asking, I'm asking the Swedish people to open their hearts to immigrants because this is going to cost in the, in the coming year. This was just before the immigration wave. And that was quite funny because he inadvertently uh, admitted that this comes at a cost. Uh, uh, this actually has an economic cost. And that was considered beyond the pale uh, up until that point. So he... He actually opened the door. You should only say that it increases pluralism yeah, yeah, and yeah. diversity. Exactly. This will cost us. Open your hearts. And so suddenly it was okay to say that, oh, this might actually be expensive. Um, so it had a completely adverse effect to what he, he was trying to say or do. And what's your, your assessment of the future? Where is all this heading? Um, well... Sweden has, we've experienced two terror attacks in central Stockholm. Uh, we have, um, according to Swedish police, we have 2,000 uh, active, violent, uh, potentially violent Islamists operating in Sweden. 2,000. That's a big number for an open, liberal society like, like Sweden. Um, we have um, a lot of problems uh, with uh, that have to deal with crime, they have to do with crime among immigrants as well, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to sex crime. Uh, again, you know, 
I want to stress that this is a minority of immigrants, but still the problems are there. And, uh, and the, the, so this is causing social tension, but it's also causing political t tension. We have a party at, as I said, 17 point something percent, which is no other party wants to touch or, have, or, yeah. or talk to because they're, you know, they used to be Nazis. Or some of them. Uh, some of them. Okay. So, yeah. If you so would say all a, this, I'm sorry, yeah. So it's a very um, socially uh, uh, difficult situation for Sweden in a new way. We're, we're not a country that used to have, um, you know, these areas of sort of vulnerable areas, social areas of social exclusion. We're not used to, used to having these sorts of problems. We don't know how to deal with them. And then to that comes the political tension. Um, so so we, are, we have these new political divisions and new social divisions that we don't really know how to deal with. So how did you survive with your opinions and your criticism of, 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 of these policies for so long? You've been <laughs> controversial for how long now? Um, I'm less controversial now, which is quite interesting. You are? Yeah. Uh, what would have happened if you said all this on national Swedish TV? Uh, what would happen? Five years ago, I would probably lose my, my columns. I would probably not be invited to, to talk on Swedish television anymore. And, and now I, you can? I assume that would happen. Are we putting you in danger? <laughs> no, you're not. No. Definitely okay. not. No, the, the discussion is much more open now. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, this is so news this to is, me. This is something that happened after Frederick Reinfeldt asked the Swedish pe people to open their hearts. Um, and um, it definitely ha happened after Cologne, the mass attacks, and the news that something similar had happened in Sweden, um, and the immigration wave in general. Just, it, it could no longer be, this conversation could no longer be suppressed. Um, so tell us a bit before we, before we end about Quillette. You are now yes. editor of the European... European editor, yes. Of, of Quillette. Tell us about this refreshing magazine. <laughs> so Quillette is an online magazine that started three years ago. Um, it was founded by Claire Lehman in Sydney. And uh, in three years, she managed to build a, a well-respected platform for th free thought and um, uh, mainly academic discussion uh, and debate. And uh, we now have one million unique readers a month after three years. So it's quite a lot. Do some consider it dangerous to write there? Do you find people who hesitate? Because, you know, the dark web intellectual crowd, I see them exactly. sharing Quillet everywhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Peterson, uh, Haidt, uh, Murray and others. You know, I don't think that most people would uh, find it dangerous to write for Quillet. Um, I... Um, I speak to a lot of writers who, who just find it exciting and uh, interesting to write for us. But sure, there are some, some circles where Colette is considered uh, controversial. This has been a much more optimistic conversation than I expected. <laughs> so I ought to thank you twice for it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Paulina Neuding. Thank you for having me.